back to another episode of the Higher Level Podcast. Um, so joining us this evening is Joseph Clifford. Obviously, look forward to we're looking forward to having you on, Joseph, and, and pick your brain about a few things. Obviously, you've you've been a busy man throughout lockdown, uh, releasing an ebook, and um, so putting the rest of us to shame here that I'm sitting doing nothing. <laughs> um, uh, how's things been, mate? How's how's life for you at the moment? Uh, strange. Yeah, I was. We were just having a conversation. It's really strange because I I travel between forty and forty five events a year. Now it's my whole calendar is just empty. And so what happened was I was on a four continent tour with the Olympics and the boxing task force. Um, I work as the supervisor, a cut technician. Um, and so basically what it's up when we were in Senegal, it was a whisper, but it's when we got the Jordan, our man, it was a loud noise in the background. And then when we hit London, we were supposed to go off to Argentina, Argentina closed its borders completely. And then you could see, like, there were no volunteers or very few volunteers in London except the forces, the RAF and the armed forces. So really appreciative for them for turning up. And people were scared because there were all sorts of rumours coming out and stuff. And But it's basically wiped my whole calendar clear because I was supposed to be travelling with that team for seven. It was a 72-day trip for yeah. Olympic qualifications. And then we were supposed to jump on to... Um, then France for the World Championships, then the Olympics. My whole calendar is just gone. You said about the ebook, the ebook. I didn't really have a choice if I'm being honest, James. I have to be torn over a shell and somehow. So the ebook was just one way of doing it. I'll never get rich in the ebook, but it was something I loved doing. So. If it's a labour of love as well, and do you enjoy that process of getting down there and ju- just getting your thoughts out on your page? And, and obviously you're trying to pass on knowledge of your experience and stuff like that for, for people that are coming through, potentially people that are looking to be cut men and stuff like that in the future. Is that an enjoyable process for you? I, I, I love teaching, to be honest. I'd rather, I'd rather teach these days because... I won't say I've had my fill of events. I still love doing the local shows because it's grassroots, whether it's grassroots boxing, grassroots MMA, grassroots uh, whatever, Mutsoi or whatever. I love turning up for the lot and there's characters and there's atmosphere. And now, again, just connecting it to today, all of that's going to change drastically. You know, so in terms of crowds being at events, maybe no crowds, and in terms of atmosphere and stuff, all of that's going to change. So it's about yeah. adapting to it all now. Uh, it, you you got to backpedal. I, I was like, I was born in the 60s in a recession. I lived through a recession in the 80s, right? It's nothing new. They come and go. But the thing is, you got to you got to survive. you got to keep going forward. and you, you can't sit still, really. Game over. Yeah. Absolutely. I will look at the picture that's painted at the moment as all doom and gloom and there's a lot of people struggling in that. There is there is still yeah. some good things out there. And your ebook yeah. is I know you do seminars and stuff like that. Not everybody's going to manage to get us get to a seminar or it's maybe not accessible to everybody. Is yeah. a thought with the book as well is it's very globally accessible to people that maybe wouldn't be able to get to a seminar. Sure. See, there's a lot of online courses. You were saying about setting up courses and stuff and yeah. The reason why I'd done it in the first place was because I remember I've been involved with boxing since I was a nipper. And I, in, in my thirties, I went back as a mature student to study physiotherapy. And I took a break, a sabbatical for about four years. And when I come back in to boxing, I, I came back into an environment that used to be my home. And it was just totally alien to me because I was working in hospitals and institutions. And now I'm walking into a situation where the carman has a lump of grease on top of the ring post. The kids have to get caught. The carman has no gloves, and he's taking a lump of grease off the ring post to put it into the wound. And I just, it, it was just such a bad picture. Yeah. And I, I thought to myself, right, I can sit, 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 boy, and I seen lots of it in the period of time I'd come back into boxing, and I just said, look, it's enough, it's enough. I can't do this. I couldn't honestly keep my mouth shut. 
So I just said, right, there's, there's a positive way of doing it and a negative way of doing it. The positive way is to educate people, and that's exactly what it did. And I designed the course in 2009 in my own backyard, thinking nobody turned up. Uh, I think the first course around 25 people, I was amazed. And then basically it's gone out there because I challenge kind of the belief systems and the methods and the tools that cut men use because the only reference you have as a cut person is what you see on YouTube because cut men don't really share it too much. They like keeping it here. And um, it was really tough to actually get some educated knowledge from somebody because they didn't want to share it. And so what you did was your only reference was YouTube or other people said, oh, such and such is a great cut person. But when I watched it as a healthcare practitioner, I'm thinking even as stuff, fundamental forced aid, like compression on an open wound, some of the stuff that I was watching was just, was just, oh, it was butcher shop stuff. And I just thought to myself, right, okay, you know, I can structure a course around evidence and showing people what actually does work within that time frame. And because I have a constitution, I'm a working class lad, I'd worked hard to get the physio degree, and I was tied down to a constitution that doesn't allow me to use dangerous drugs, adrenaline, epinephrine, or prescribe them to third parties. I was thinking, how the hell are these getting away with using epinephrine, microfibular collagen, trombin, you know, it could go on a risk, uh, dehydrators, multipliers, and stuff like that. So I just, I, I said, you're right, okay, let's look for alternatives. Not alternatives, a bad word, but other hemostatic agents that, that aren't so dangerous because epinephrine can give you cardiac arrest and it can also bring you back from a cardiac arrest. And although when it goes into an open wound, it's, um, it gets metabolized, they say, it doesn't matter. In this day and age, you shouldn't be using something that's a dangerous drug and you shouldn't be prescribing it to somebody without any dose or medical history or blah, 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 and all the rest of it. But we do a hook, line, and sink, and everybody turns the other way. So I've challenged that belief system and developed the courses around that. And I never, ever, ever thought in my wildest dreams that it would take off and be in six continents. And over the last five years, I've just constantly been on the road, whether it's in Olympic boxing, it's uh, been with the UFC, been with uh, most of the major world organizations, um, yeah. design programs, cutman programs for them and stuff like that. It's been just wild, to be honest. And when you're trying to make those changes of your voice and your concerns, obviously, uh -huh. do you get much pushback? Are you getting a lot of pushback from that or did you at the time? Oh, my career suffers as a result of it. I mean, yeah. you know, obviously... There's a, a generation of equipment that don't like me because I challenge that system, mm. right? So they don't like me, but I accept that because I'm taking the bread out of the mouth kind of thing, and I accept that. I have regrets about how I started to do it using others as examples. I use all my own work as examples um, over the last couple of years. I didn't have video footage back then, so I used other people as references. That was a mistake, really. And so I really kind of wound people up. Because yeah. these were people that were legends in the game. And the more I looked at them, the more I realized that it was like really cloak and dagger stuff. And it wasn't what it was supposed to be. In other words, it wasn't supposed to be a hemostasis getting a fighter to a position where they stopped bleeding and you did it. You did it. Not, 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 not fluked it or, you know, whatever. So, um yeah, it's been, it's, it's been a rough journey in lots of ways because I've challenged the British Board of Boxing Control. I've challenged other organizations. I was in, um, I've done an East and West Coast tour of the States last year. And on the East Coast, I, I emailed Massachusetts Athletic Commission about the norms in terms of using dangerous drugs. And, and they say what everybody else says, you need to have a license, you have to be a registered licensed practitioner Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And so, I just thought, right, then, 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 why are you wishing the drug and and have fights and stuff like that? And so, it's it's just a quagmire. So you don't really make friends when you challenge systems, particularly if they've been there for decades, long, long time. And, and if you think that the cutman profession is 150 years old, around about there and thereabouts, and they have kind of, there's a certain kind of element that's come into cutman now and cut woman, cut person, that's ego-driven. Um, it's become very, 
it, they've stopped being officials and they've become more important than the fighters sitting on the still. And mm. it, it, it's, it's not what we're there for. We're there for the kids on the still. That's all we're there for. We're not there to self-promote and stuff. I know I do tons of videos and I put them out there, but it's, it's my company. It's what I do. Yeah, but so, yeah, I, I would I would say that you you're not really you're not doing that because I have seen I won't see any names you see cut men with sponsorship and stuff like that on their, their garments as they're walking out. Um, obviously you're you're doing this in your own time out with fighting and stuff. So I would I would say the situations are definitely different. Um, James, I, I'd love to get, bring you on in this because you've obviously you've spent a lot of time in corners. I'm sure you've seen some some uh, horror stories and. Uh, so I'd love to bring you in on this and get your opinion on this as well. I'm sure you've got a ton of questions. Yeah, man. Uh, the, hi, Joe. The, the first thing, there doesn't seem to be a lot of, there's not a lot of books and stuff out now on the subject. So I think the e-book no. um, is, is very important, I think, because I don't think I don't think a lot of people appreciate the work that you guys do and how important it is for a, a cut man the, the effect it can have on a fighter's career like if you get a young fighter and he, he maybe gets cut five or six fights in and, and he loses in a boxing match it, it can have a snowball effect on the rest of the guy's career and stuff like that so I think um, I think you you bring out this ebook and, and putting that knowledge out there and the courses that you run and stuff like that and educating people I think it's massive because I go to, I go to shows like every weekend the same as you and I see these guys it's usually the coach Who's got the bucket with the water? Have you got vast? Mm. You'll have the fancy ones. will have a an end swell or something like that, and and that's it. Um, some cotton buds stuck in a a wristband, yeah. and he thinks he's good to go. Oh, but yeah. when I get to the the UFC, like I've had my, both my fighters have been cutting fights in the UFC, um, and it's a worry for me as a coach coming into the corner. But then when you see the cut man coming in and, and taking care of it, it, it's something less for me to worry about. It's something less for the fighter to worry about. And it just seems like, I know it, back in the day, I, I've just finished reading a book. It's a book I've read multiple times about old boxing coaches for Stillman's Gym back in the, in the early mm-hmm. days in New York. And every one of these coaches were regarded as expert cut men. Um, and I think that it's, it's an art for them. And I think it's almost been lost to, to a degree or what you're saying guys are, are using some kind of weird practices it's like they, they keep secrets and, and they get these reputations but I think you coming out and just making this knowledge public and g- giving coaches <clears throat> access to it, it's a massive thing you, you know if I was to break it down if you approach there, there, there's only a, it, the, the simplicity of it is if, if there is an injury you know, you make contact with the injury, you clean the blood spatter, you treat the injury, and then you put a barrier over it. That's it in a nutshell. That's the easy part. The hard part is if you're walking in a if you're walking a multi event or you're walking in the octagon, right? And now it's an open space. And coaches can come around. So the thing you have to be mindful for is creating space for the coach to make eye contact with the athlete, be able to give them water. If you smother the kid, it's not good for the coach. It's not good for the athlete because the athlete needs that connection to the coach. So your position is key. Now, if you change position, you know this, James, and you're in a bad spot and you're right hand dominant, all of a sudden you're asked about elbow. So you, you've got to be practiced in what you do. So if you make a shift, it's got to be something that you're used to doing. Uh, most professionals are good professionals now have to walk with both hands. It's about creating that space so the coach has contact. So you, you're just, uh, what's the best way? A shadow in, in, in the corner. And then the corner is as normal as it could be with the coach doing his thing, with the athlete and stuff like that. And you've no voice. You just get on with your job and you just walk the corner, you know. So that's a good cut, man. Bad, bad cut, man. I don't want to say bad, but cut men that make themselves known in corners. I usually, it's, it's not really good if you're taking up coaches, spatial elbows and forearms, or if I'm giving the athlete that voice, I know what you tell me to do, James. You know, yeah. like, you're yeah. not there to do that. There is a good man. You never heard me to walk the corner. The promotion did. So what am I get doing giving a voice to the kid? And I've watched good men do that as well. So that's the simple part. The difficult part is when it's multiple injuries, and particularly in MMA, 
and you could have three injuries, a nosebleed, a laceration, and a hematoma over the eye. So you have to treat all three. Well, how about I tell you, you treat all three with one hand and you leave space for the coach while your other hand's walking, greasing up the other side of the face and doing whatever, you know? So that's the art you're talking about. That's the act of practice and doing. And that's Plus the there. Sorry. Yeah, you're saying something, James. Plus there, you've got a time constraint there because you've got the minute rest. But, but for the time you get in there with the stool and whatever, you've got 50 seconds, maybe 45 seconds. Correct. Yeah, 100%. But there's new stuff out there right now. Uh, Quick Cloth has developed a product which is a cloth, right? A 10 by 10 cloth, um, 5 inch by, I don't, I don't know what it works out, inch by 5 by 5, 2 by 2, I oh, forget it, I'm gone. Um, it's a 10 by 10 cloth and it can stop an arterial blade and a venal blade, right? So you don't have to bring anything else with you except that cloth. So you could clean the blood off the face and actually treat the injury with the same cloth. You don't need a wristband anymore. You don't need swabs anymore. So what you're doing is you're saving time and it's efficient and effective. The thing is, like, there's a certain kind of attachment to the tools that cut men use, like end swells. End swells don't, if, if you were to compare an end swell to, to an ice bag, the only thing the end swell would win over is temperature, maintaining temperature or colder. But that depends on if the end swell is still in ice when you take it out of the bucket or uh, if it's been left in a bucket of water, just cold water. The ice bag probably would be a little, if you could keep an ice bag in a freezer bag or something. Um, temperature, but the advantage you use an ice bag is that you can cover the whole contour of the face. An end swell, although mm -hmm. curved, they usually curve the wrong way. And even the ones that are curved in the shape of the contours of your face, because you're so unique as a human being, everybody's contours are different. So it doesn't completely fit. An ice bag does it all day long. It costs uh, less than, it's about two pence resealable ice bags. So what's better? And then I can dispose of the resealable, whereas the end swell, I've seen Cutman do it. They treat abrasions with swelling and they throw it back into the bucket, cross-contaminating the bucket. Now, people say like, you know what you want us to do? Wear condoms when we get into the ring to stay so totally safe. And I say, no, just take care of business. Wear a pair of gloves. Be smart. Take them off when you get out of the ring and just put on a new pair. Protect the kid. Protect yourself. Protect yourself. You have to go back to your wife and family. So, yeah, you, um, You've touched on a, a few really interesting things. There's something that I'd never really thought about. It was that, issue, that, that space issue about you... Like you, your words been a shadow. That's something I never actually thought about. I never associated with a cop man. But you explaining that there, that makes sense. James, for you, is that something you notice if you've got cop men in there? Are you noticing that how much space in their body position? It's like uh, it's like when you've got a good referee, you don't notice they're there. Like if if you've got a good cop man, they come in and do their job. Um, Joe, Joe used the word efficient, and that's that's exactly what you want. You want them come in do the job and then you don't notice they're there it doesn't, it doesn't throw you off as a coach which doesn't bring any confusion or, or panic into the corner um, it's mm. the same when you get a good referee do you know what I mean but then you do get these guys who, who want to be the centre of attention a wee bit yeah. and, but they'll even position themselves in a way where they know the camera's going to pick them up right. and stuff like that do you know what I mean like, um, but the, the best guys are like they're like a shadow they, they come in do what needs to be done and then leave um, right. and, and just in my experience anyway yeah yeah and Joseph as well I, I was really interested to find out what, what's the differences like is that when you're working in a, as a cop man in boxing MMA or, or Muay Thai is, uh, is there noticeable differences or do you have to change things in the corner or what, is, is there differences there well if I was to give you the first example in terms of position when you enter right Let's, let's look, uh, they call MMA a ring now because Octagon's on with the UFC and Cage is a little bit too severe to throw it out there. It's, it's bad language kind of thing. Um, so they call it an MMA ring. Right. The ring is an open space, so you can enter from either corner. There's lots of space around the athlete sitting on the still. Right. So you've got a ton of space to walk out. If you're walking in a boxing ring or a Muay Thai ring, a kickboxing, K1, whatever, and it's in a ring, boxing type ring, square, well, then you've got sharp angles to walk off. Now, if the coach is old school and he always wants to get in, then you have to walk through the ropes. 
Now, if you don't organize yourself, now this is just body position, set yourself up if you're working with a team. And if you are a hired help, you, you ask them, which side do you want me to go on? Where do you want me to walk? Do you want me to get in when the fighter gets caught or do you want me to stay outside this coach go in or whatever? My good corners will let you get in. But some old school coaches just don't like it. They just, they'd rather have the contact with the athlete. So what happens if you end up on the wrong side? So the injury is over the other side, that side, but you're over this side. Well, then you have to reach around the athlete or reach across the athlete, one or the other. What's the best way of doing it? But if I reach across the athlete, I'm blocking the coach. But if I reach around the athlete, then I can stabilize the head and I can treat them without blocking the coach. If you're all elbows and forearms, then the coach can't get in with the water and the athlete can't see the coach. And that eye contact and relationship is so important. So position is key first off. And if you are working with new teams, you need to get that down. You need to talk to them, which way do you want me to go, blah, blah, blah. And that good Again, good cut people have that down and they'll know what to do. Then the thing is treating the cut sometimes just out of habit. Other people that are around you will still go about the business. So say if, the, if you're in a boxing ring and there's four in a corner, it's, it's, a, it's a full house and the guy just still wants to put the ice on the back of the neck and he still wants to put it on the fighter's chest because that's what the fighter wants. Well, you could be treating and he doesn't take that into account and he's putting his hands all over your space. And you have to kind of defend that patch, just gently kind of ushering in his hand out of the way while you kind of treat, but leaving the space for the coach. There's so many dynamics in a corner, it's unbelievable. And I remember yeah. walking a gig in the UFC where one of the coaches was on a, um, a tripod stand. He was inching his way over to the corner. And when they opened the door, there's only one allowed in. The, the old rule was there was only one coach allowed in the corner. Well, he took off like a bachelor, like his arse is on for it, and he was in before me. So there was two of them in now, and I had to call one of them out so I could go in. And that looks sloppy on camera yeah. because you're supposed to be a walking professional. You're supposed to have that down between the gatekeeper and yourself. And uh, so I learned a lesson. So I just blocked them off now before I get in so I have good access. <laughs> now there's two coaches allowed in, so it's not a problem. Yeah. But you still have to defend your patch. You still have to get in there in the best place possible to treat particularly if you have multiple injuries. And for, we'll, we'll use the USC's example there just because you've brought them up. What I'd love to know is when you're leading up to an event like a, a USC, what, what's your preparation like? What's your day like leading up to that? How, how do you prepare yourself and get everything ready before, before you start having to get in there and potentially patch up wounds and, and, and that sort of stuff? Yeah, I... Because I'm blessed, I'm kind of walking 40 to 45, say 40 to 42, whatever, average events a year. I'm constantly walking, right? So nothing really changes in terms of how I treat. They'd be MMA events, boxing events, primarily yeah. MMA these days. Uh, boxing's a little bit dead in the country at the moment in Ireland. Um, and so I would, you know, I, I have the practice of doing, but say if I hadn't, and I hadn't, like now during COVID, there's no contact. Well, then I have a dummy's head that I can actually walk on and I practice angles and I come from different sides and I practice my treatments and stuff like that because you're supposed to be polished when you get there. And if you are conscientious about your walk, well, then you want to present yourself the best you can. That's, mm. that's I would spend, I, I would spend at least, I'd probably go over things like 40 minutes here and there. And if I hadn't wrapped a pair of hands in a bit, I'd, you know, I'd be, uh, if, Either my wife would get it, or if I'm out the mother and father's house, I deal with them. No. <laughs> I, guess, I guess that takes his next uh, right on it because obviously it's something else we wanted to pick your brain a wee bit about is, is hand drum itself. Yeah. Um, first of all, what, is, what I wanted to ask you, just because I'm nosy, is What's the worst hand drop you've actually seen at, a, at an event, a high level event? Don't need any names or, or anything like that. I'm, ju I'm just interested to hear. What, what's the worst thing you've seen? Is there anything you've seen where you've had to go, no, you need to stop and, and, um, and do, it, do it right? Amongst the officials, we would all, there are certain individuals that stick out like beacons when they come into the house and it's like, it's like paper mache. And, <laughs> The athlete relationship with coach, because they've been getting it done with coach probably for 10 years or five years, he or she is not going to complain because the coaches trust 
there's a relationship and you're not going to comment on it but sometimes you see really really dodgy raps and you're kind of the only time you'd intervene if if it was dangerous in mm. terms of broke the rule set but regardless of how a coach puts it on that's that's their business we we wouldn't really interfere but there there are probably one or two individuals that work who are supposed to be professional in terms, well, I, I take that back. They are professional in other means, but definitely hand wrapping is not one of the skills that they've nailed. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah, is there a, I take it there's an element of pride for you when you're, when you're wrapping hands, you want it to be good, perfect or, or as close to as you can get it every time. Well, so I said to you, you're, this is your first day on the UFC, and the thing I, yeah. I've always loved about the UFC was, and James did know, if you walk in, like you have athlete relations, then you have officials, etc. We want to make that experience for you five star. The most important person is the person sitting on the still, the men and women that, that talk, give their time and energy, and the coaches that give their time and energy to get those kids there. The most important part is the athlete. And you try and make the coaches feel, you know, like they're, that they're in a good place. I mean, uh, they're surrounded by professionals, consummate professionals. And so for us, it's not really a, <clears throat> your practice. So it's a given norm that you're going to come up with something that's quality, right? It's a given norm. The rest of it really is all about what the athlete wants. If the athlete wants this, that, and the other, and it, it probably doesn't make sense, but that's what they want. That's what they get. And that's what you yeah. give them. Because it's their day, it's their time, and the thing is you try and make it the best experience of their life. Something they'll never forget for the rest of their days. And I love that. I love yeah. that. The hand, uh, the hand wrapping experience as well is it's a massive part of the whole process for these fighters. Yeah. It's like, well, all my guys, they switch on when, whenever they're getting their hand wrapped. Then they know like, the, the stuff's coming, mm-hmm. like, the, the fight's coming, it's a process. And, it's so, such an important thing, man. It, it, it has to be done right, obviously, for, the, for everything that goes on after it that night. But then again, hand injuries have, have wrecked careers before, um, yeah. or have hampered careers, or you've got guys having to change how they fight because of hand injuries and stuff yeah. like that. But for, for my guys, we always talk about, like, on the night, when, especially guys who've never fought before, we run through it. And we spar on a Friday night, they'll get their hands <coughs> wrapped, wrapped, wrapped proper and that, but it's always a part of the mental process. Like once your hands are getting wrapped, it's time to zone everything in and just get that laser like focus on, on what's coming. Mm-hmm. Um, so, like that, when well, you're talking about that ex- experience, making it all about them and stuff, it's so important, I think. Yeah. You know, like, I, I bet you, you remember the first time, like, if. If you experience somebody really positive in the sport, you'll always remember for the rest of your days, you know, like kind of thing. But I, hand wrapping, it's it, it's it's kind of funny in the sense that most times you put a hand wrap on, I could take a bet with you, I'd give the fighter five minutes before they go into the toilet and have a dump. Yeah. Just nervous <laughs> energy. You know how that works, right? We have it down to a two. You say, all right, give them five minutes. I'll give them five minutes, see where he goes. And then it's like, gone. In, into the top of the dump. It's just down face on the and just, you know, empty, whatever. Um, but it's, it's we're all together. You know, I'm, my, my, I love Muhammad Ali's the shortest poem in history. He said, me, we. And he was talking about the platform and the podium and the people that turn up to see him. And without all of this, none of, none of this would be possible for me. And that's exactly what the deal is. We're there for the athlete. We just put the platform up and, and we provide our platform. We make them feel at home. They come in and do that thing and then leave. And and as you say, James, good officials you never see, ever see. They're in and out and they're gone. And the event has run perfectly. That's a good, good event if you don't see the officials. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And again, this is this is my this is me being a wee bit nosy. Um I want to speak about some some things you've had to deal with in a cage and a ring in terms of injuries. Talk us through what's been the most difficult moment in your in your career in terms of an injury that you're trying to help a fighter with. Uh, if you could speak to me about that, just like I say, I'm, I'm very curious to to get your thoughts and tell me about your experiences. We well, you'd very rarely interfere with corners. Uh, mm-hmm. I've been in corners where um, the coach 
has got extremely nervous because it's probably their first time in Sky Sports or it's the first time in front of uh, BT Sports or whatever it is or first time in front of Fox TV or and and the coach just freezes. And sometimes you just have to give them a little prompt and say, hey, look, give, give the kid water. And then that just sets off the habit mm. of doing and then away they go. Um, I've had fighters sit on stools and when you're treating them, they turn around and go, how do you think I'm doing? And... and <laughs> You know, you say, yeah, grand, grand. You know what I mean? You're, you're grand, of course. Um, and it, it always kind of, you know, it takes you back because you're not there for that. But then boxing, if you're walking with a team and you've been with the team for a, a period of time and you are one of the coaches and you are a cut man walking and a coach, that's a whole different scenario. Then you can give some input in the corner. But the worst experience I've ever had, uh, Joker Valio. Joe Carvalho. I've witnessed two deaths in the sport. That wasn't, um, that was my career that was on Joe Carvalho's. And it's so personal and heart wrenching when you see the people that it affects. <clears throat> it's so personal and heart wrenching to know that you signed up for the gig or you signed your team up for that gig. I wasn't there that night. I was, I was away at the time, but it was my crew that was on it. And you signed up for that gig and you. You had knowledge beforehand that probably not all safety precautions weren't taken place. Why did you take partner in the first place? Because there was probably no other team to fill in the gap. And the last thing you expected was somebody was going to die that night. When you see the yeah. impact that it has, and particularly when you pick a kid up from the airport and you drive them to the event, and they're telling you what they're going to do after the way and what they're going to do when they go home and where they're going to take their kid and misses and stuff like that. And then the death the next day. I mean, we, 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 you know, injuries, I, I've witnessed some horrific injuries, yeah, particularly MMA. You notice that, James, as well. You get multiple injuries and all sorts in comparison to boxing. Boxing's really tiddlywinks in terms of injuries in comparison to MMA. Um, but when you see somebody and their eyes are rolling in the back of their head and they're on the floor and they have a nerve or their arms are frozen in a, a position, uh, really severely concussed. Uh, it's a traumatic brain injury in some shape, form or fashion. You know, like, it, it always sets off alarm bells. Yeah. And all you want to do is just make sure that you're not in the way of the, uh, you just hope that the emergency staff or the, the people that are there. Now in Ireland, we have to have an anaesthetist. We have to have an emergency room on site. We have to have two doctors, trauma trained, etc. Boom, 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 boom. Two ambulances. That particular gig that night, there was only one ambulance. There was a local GP. There was a Red Cross team, volunteers, and uh, I think one or two paramedics or an EMT. And when the, when the <clears> shit hit the fan, it was like the Keystone cops had come to town. Um, they'd left. They, when he collapsed at the post-fight, when he collapsed in the back, they, when they ran in, they'd left the, um, the gurney behind, and they had to go back and get it. And then when they got the gurney and brought it in, they couldn't get it out through the doors of the dressing room because nobody done a, a, a pre-run. And so basically, they were fumbling around um, to get him onto the ambulance. And when they took off, the, the driver wasn't communicating to which hospital to go because James's hospital was five minutes away. They went 25 minutes away. And then the doctor, I think, shouted from the back, where he is going, where he is going. In the process of all of that, They'd forgotten to bring the, the defib for, you know, to give the heart a kickstart. He started to asphyxiate in the, the back of the ambulance. He was on the floor by the time he got to the hospital and they were giving him um, CPR on the floor of the ambulance. I think he fell on the floor or something happened. So, but you signed your team up for that. Now, I've equally walked in countries that are extremely wealthy and when you get to that country that's extremely wealthy, you expect that the standard would be off the Richter in terms of, you know, uh, the emergency services, two ambulance doctors and blah, 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 and all the rest of it. And then you turn up to an event and find out that, that you're the most qualified person there. And, and, and that's kind of scary stuff because you live by your wits there. You're yeah. thinking, here I'm fights. I just hope I get through the night. And I, if I was anywhere else, if I was at home, I'd have walked out the door. But I don't have a choice. I'm at a, and you look at the people that are there to take care of business, 
And you're thinking, if I walk out, it's going to be left to these two egomaniacs sitting behind me who just want to get their face on camera. So it's we've we've all done it. We've all ended up in those places. And sometimes we don't think of the consequences. But, you know, when you're dealing with severe weight loss, uh, dehydration and then rehydration, and then you're dealing with a situation where there's lots of trauma in there and stuff like that, as a cook person, as an official working 40 odd events a year, you get desensitized to trauma, you get desensitized to concussion, you get desensitized to nasty lacerations and all sorts of stuff. You're seeing her all the time. Sometimes you miss the small stuff, and the small stuff can cost the kid his life or her life. And that's yeah. the kind of stuff you need to wake up to. We can't just... Cook people have never had a book of, of rules and regulations. We've always worked on their second rules. Nobody's ever written anything down. And uh, we have no responsibility to anybody. But I definitely think that in terms of what we do, we need to have a higher level of training if we're dealing with that, particularly at professional level where it goes five rounds in five minutes. That's where it gets dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. And ju- just back on the uh, Carvalho incident, obviously that was that was something that I think shocked everybody in the, the Irish yeah. and UK MMA scene. It was, it was a horrendous thing. Um, the first question really is, and I don't know if you want to answer this or not, but do you feel that was that was preventable what happened there in terms of if the proper safety things were in place? Do you feel? Yeah. Yeah. It, I mean, he asphyxiated in the back of the ambulance on his own vomit because nobody, uh, somebody had done um, a tracheotomy. Tracheotomy. Yeah. Okay. Saying it with a Dublin accent doesn't really work too well. So. <laughs> He, they did, somebody had done a certificate in it, but they couldn't actually apply it in the ambulance. So, or something like that it was on. I don't want to misquote it, but it was something like that. But it was totally, I won't say totally, but it, 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 there could have been a better result at the end of it than what yes. there was. Because it was a hospital five minutes away and they were driving for 20 odd minutes and they had to turn around and come back to another hospital. Yeah. And just yeah. when you talk about the gunny and stuff like that there, it's... Uh... It's, it's, uh, what, what was it obviously you had a team there at that, that event T- tell me a wee bit what was that phone call like you got you weren't there yourself but you, you got the phone call how was that in terms of your career is that one of the most difficult phone calls you've had to take yeah because like you're responsible so like we had to report to the police station and, and, and uh, give a report because I'm in charge I'm the one that, that uh, put the team on it and so I'm responsible for that team. I'm also, I have a code, a moral code, and I have my own, I have my own moral code, and there's a code of ethics in the game. You know, and the thing was, like, I really let that slide under the bar. But personally speaking, we took part in a show we should have never took part on because its reputation was great in the first place. Um, yeah. Certain individuals that ran it, but yet we turned up and covered it. And I had to re reevaluate the reasons we turned up our shows then. Why are we yeah. turning up our shows? You know, yeah, no, what's I, the fucking shows that really we shouldn't be doing this? I, I guess the last thing is, and if there is a positive in the situation, we have seen a change in, in MMA. So obviously, get things like safe MMA and stuff like that. Do you look at that and think, right, it, it was a tragedy, but if nothing else, maybe something positive has come out of it for fighters in the future and their safety? Mm. Yeah, you hope so. so. Yeah, hope. Ab- absolutely. Mm. Um, so, uh, just coming off that now, just to go back onto the current situation, you said you were, um, you, you had obviously you were doing a lot of travelling um, when the when the COVID thing had just started, and in, in the early stages of it, it was, there was a lot of unknown back then as well. Um, mm. How how scary was that for you to be out there away from family? And stuff like that when this thing was starting to break and, and, and rolling at the start? I think the Irish and the Scots kind of share the same mentality in more ways than one. We kind of, you know, like I was, I don't know, it's probably my generation as well, you kind of get on with it. It's just it is what it is and you get on with it kind of thing. And um, I was born in the 60s. Um, James is probably too young. No, that young. <laughs> Um, it it was like you know it is what it is and the thing was like it was a whisper uh, a loud voice and then a scream 
So mm. from Senegal, it was a whisper. Jordan, a man, it became a loud voice. And by the time we hit London, it was a scream. Yeah. And we were in the Asian games with all the worst affected countries. But in Jordan, a man, the IOC were off the rick that they were amazing. But the Jordanian IOC I'm talking about, they had the Chinese team in quarantine for nearly a month and had tested them multiple times before they released them into the population. Same went for other really badly affected nations. Now, remember, they were, they'd flattened the curve on the way down before it even hit us. And they were all in the same house. And it just so happened in Jordan that the dressing room area was really confined because I was walking back of house in the dressing room as a commissioner and co-technician out front. But my job, because there was only one of me at the time, I was, I was in back of house, so it was very confined space. But it was probably the safest place to be because all of them had been tested multiple times. Yeah. But by the time we'd got to London, um, because there was a lack of volunteers, um, it probably wasn't as well run as it could have been. Mm. And it wasn't anybody's, it was just because people were afraid over the COVID. And to be honest with you, at that point, my wife had come to visit me um, because I was supposed to go over to Argentina after for the Pan American Games. And I was more concerned about her contracting it or something. And we've just moved back in with two old age pensioners. My, fa my father has a respiratory condition. And so he's 81, he, he, he's high risk. And so when I came back, we, we literally had to cut the house in two and quarantine for 14 days. And then yeah. it's been really strange because my whole world is upside down in terms of what I do. I'm sure James is the same in James and your job as well, uh, yes. James Hamilton. I'll call you yeah. by your surname just to separate the Jameses. <laughs> um, you know, like it's all, it's all got very weird because we can't tell what's around the corner anymore. You know, usually you'd predict that you'd be there on this weekend at that time. But now because of surges, we're talking about going back a phase, going forward, going back, going forward. So you, you, you can't predict where you're going to be next. And it's the unpredictability of it really that's affecting people right now, I think, more than anything else. Yeah, and I think as well, I don't, I don't know, I'll speak for myself here, I don't know what you feel about this, but I think there's a massive level of dif distrust from the information right. we're getting because it's, it's constantly changing and then, it, I mean, you almost get to a point where you think, is it as bad as initially thought? Should we have locked down? And, and you just start questioning things and, and obviously, uh, James, for you, you we, we, we've had the news again about, about gyms and stuff like that and pubs open, Fat, uh, fast food places open, beaches packed, but you can't go to the gym. I, I mean, you must be scratching your head at that, mate. I am. Um, I can't figure out the logic in it at all. Um, mm -hmm. like, I understand the gyms might be maybe a, a kind of breeding ground for, for pass it on and stuff like that, um, but I don't, I don't see how it's any more of a a kind of breeding ground for it than guys being in pubs I, I'm walking the dogs a couple of nights a week past the pubs here and the front door's open and there's 30 people in the pub there's no social distance and they're all just pissed they're spilling it outside and then going back to sissies and stuff but I can't get in the gym and and, and look, train people or, or work on keeping them healthy a big thing I'm finding with it is, is it's not even the physical health aspect it is yeah. it's how it's affecting people mentally um mm -hmm. There's been there's been a lot of instances of suicide here in in Scotland mm. since the lockdown. There, there's the crime rates mm. up. There's every time you go on social media, somebody's house has been broken. Into, vans are getting robbed, the tools and stuff. But I, I'm getting to a stage now where some of my students are messaging me and they're struggling with stuff mentally. They need somebody to talk to and stuff like that. And I I don't think the government take into account the effect that gyms have on people or, or that way. Um, it seems to be a massive problem but there just seems to be no I think I'm quite a logical person like if somebody gives me a reason why the gyms had to stay closed like if they sit me down and explain it to me then that's fine but to, to not open the gyms but to keep the pubs open um, to, to let people use public transport the way they are like the, the, I was in Glasgow the day and, and the subways were packed and stuff like that um, it's just it's just no logic to it whatsoever. It's, 
But I'm I'm the same as Joe. I'm just like I'm just going to sit back and and let it play out. And what can you do? I I need to keep keep the, the people close to me and safe, mm. and that's it, really. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And, and the one with the pubs, I mean, there's, I know the same for Irishmen. There's no way you're going to get five, ten Scotsmen, Irishmen in a pub, five drinks and they've been locked up with their missus for four months. She's been driving them around the bends. You can't tell me they're going to be in their social distancing. Not a chance. No yeah, chance. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I don't. Yeah, I, I don't even drink. Can I want to go into these places just because? <laughs> I'm like, fuck you, I'm just going to start it's drinking. Better atmosphere. <laughs> aye, aye. It's, 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 it's crazy, man. It is, it is, it is mad, mad times. But hopefully by the next year, this will all be an afterthought, and it'll be a crazy thing to say. Remember 2020 when we had that, that COVID nineteen. Yeah. Hopefully that that's what happens anyway. But. Um, the positive thing is, is like when you look, one of the nicest things that I've seen is I've seen parents um, jogging on the street with their kids, cycling with their kids, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. It's like a period of time when they're young enough, it's like being retired, but your kids are still young enough and you're still young enough that you can still be very active with them and, and they're still children. Yeah. Um, and that was really sweet, you know, it was just to see people get stronger. Like James was just saying there a second ago, getting tighter, you know, just trying to keep the people around you tight. Because yeah. it's just, it's really eerie. In a time in history, in human history, <clears throat> there are so many variables now in the world. It's extremely messed up right now. Um, yeah. From the state to China to Russia, you name it. It's just so many variables at the moment. So many right-wing governments and stuff like that. We're on the tether right now. And it's just like, that doesn't help either because you're getting bombarded with that shit as well coming in on top of your social media feeds or whatever, you know. Right. Um, I don't have a TV at home. I don't have one. Um, I don't read newspapers, don't do any of that. And But, but it still reaches you somehow on your phone. You sit on the cars, you first thing in the morning, going through your emails, it pops up and... You know, it's, it, 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 it's all got to affect you. I know they say you can only control the controllables, but again, if you're thinking about the next chapter, you know, I think yeah. what most of us have done is we've reeled it back into 24 hours at a time Yeah. because it's the only place we can kind of make some kind of sense of it is right here, right now. That's it. Yeah, I mean, you yeah. said something there that I, I think that's all apply. Well, I don't know, James, you can, I'll, I'll let you speak for yourself, but... The man hanging out of COVID that I, I, I've found personally is I've had the opportunity to, with my second kid, my daughter, I've, I've got to see her take her first steps, stand up for the first time, do all that stuff, all the stuff I miss with my son because I was out working. So selfishly for that, I'm a wee bit grateful that I, that I got that time that I would not have had um, but for this. So that's, that's kind of the way I'm looking at it to keep that positive spin anyway. There is there is definitely positives there, man. I'm the same. I'm, I never really realised how much I was working. Um, to be honest, I'm, I'm usually up and away at eight in the morning. I'll be back in the house maybe about two and then I'm away again at four and that's me to ten o'clock at night. We, we just with coaching and then when I'm getting in at night, I'm, I'm doing paperwork and, and administration stuff for the gym. At the weekends, I'm away fight shows if it's like a big event I'm away for the week or whatever and this has been like 10 years non-stop and uh, I've, I've got two kids obviously my my eldest boy's 14 I missed a lot of stuff with him just been working and my wee boy's just about to turn two and for the last four months I've, I've been with him every single day and just doing cool stuff with him which is again there is positives there um, yeah absolutely if, if you look for them. Aye. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah definitely. Um, d- just last thing I kind of wanted to, to speak to you about, Joseph. I know uh, I'll, br- I'll actually bring James in on this because he, know, he knows a, a lot more about it than me. Um, just about your your involvement with IMAF. Um, I'll get you, because I know you'll probably have a few things on that one, James. Yeah, we're, um, we're in the process just now. We're setting up a, we've set up a federation for Scotland, so... <coughs> Oh, wow. yeah. we're, uh, we're in the process of the application we've been talking to uh, Gosha and stuff there and, and Kenrith and it was actually Mark, Mark Goddard came up to Scotland to meet me to, 
to basically tell me you need to get on board with this um, or you're just going to get left behind so it was, it was interesting for me seeing that they're, they're, I know they're drug testing now um, and just seeing that they've, they've got the cut man courses and all that stuff it's, it's like a massive positive for me just seeing how they're they're taking care of the amateur game so it's just to see about how what your involvement is with IMA um, and how you can feel working with the guys I actually resigned. I actually resigned. <laughs> uh, yeah. But I then I set up the Cutman program. I uh I, 2016, I think it was the Europeans in Birmingham. Uh, the the Worlds, was it? No, it's Europeans, because the Worlds were held in Vegas. And um I came in with Bob Plant, Uncle Bob, um UFC legend, he he brought me in and then basically I ended up working with him. I done I'd invited members of IMAF, Izzy Carnway, and then Alistair Petit came over to Dublin and uh, I'd walked, I'd spoken to both of them, but then when I got involved, because I'd had the knowledge of doing and setting up programs working with Ava, uh, Athletic International Boxing, Olympic Boxing. I, I could put those frameworks to MMA and I set it up. Um, I help set it up. It's not a me thing, it's a we thing. And um, so that's very beneficial. So they have a standard of coaching. They have a standard of official. Um, they have external examiners there. Mark Goddard for the referee. I don't know who's over. I think they have an Australian fellow there or something like now, or maybe Angelo Tarantini from Italy. Um, but it's, it, 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 in terms of what they're trying to achieve, it's a massive conveyor belt for amateur MMA because you know, James, kids were torn pro after two amateur fights. Some of them didn't have any, but now they have a chance to, to represent the country and stand on a podium at a world championships with your national anthem going off in the background with a medal around your chest. I mean, that in itself, to wear your country's flag in your back is a massive, massive honor. And to be exposed to Russian MMA like Russia are kind of split in two. They they have kind of a Dagestan team and they have um um the Russian team. I don't want to split, but but that's pretty much they travel together as as the Russian team. They're phenomenal. The Kazakhs phenomenal. It's a whole different style. They're wrestlers. They bring that to the table, and then you have South Americans that come in. The Mexicans come in. I think Colombia are involved there. I may, I may be wrong. The Mexicans are definitely there, and they bring in that aggressive come forward style. Then you have the Americans; they come in. Some of them are very well polished, have beautiful, they're beautiful technical fighters. And then you'd see the same kind of from the British Isles; they're good technical fighters. And then individual European countries would have that same kind of technical skill. So the nice thing for kids is you can't go in there without coming out the other side having a, a higher standard than you came in with in the first place. There's not a chance you can you can go in and leave without having picked or become a higher standard yourself. Your own game is, you've risen the bar. So it's a plus plus, James. There's no negatives to that, trust me. Yeah, yeah. it looks, um, it looks definitely like it's going to push the sport forward, I think. Um, oh. So I'm, I'm looking forward to getting involved with it once, once yeah. I... Covid's at the way, but um, Scot Scotland should do all right at it. I think got some good yeah, amateurs here. You got the mentality, you know. Like yeah. you think, uh, Rob Wyford, Rob Wyford, Rob yeah. Wyford, yeah. And then you have Stevie Ray. Yeah, yeah, yeah we've got some good fighters here, man. And then uh, Cal Calderwood. Yeah, yeah Joanne ah. Calderwood. Yeah. Ah, she's. Wow, she she was amazing when she started. I haven't seen her in a while. I seen her out of UFC a while ago. I was on the bus rack. So, uh, she was really good with her first coach. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was I was waiting for that one. <laughs> um, but no, no, I think the one thing James has spoke to me about is just that that's the thing. It's that. That experience the guys get going through IMAF, it's like going out there and fighting all the different guys. I mean, it's it's got to make you a better fighter. Well. And, and I mean, that's what it's all that's what it's all about. At the end of the day, I, I look forward to it. I ho- hopefully, it, hopefully, it gets set up soon after after everything that's gone uh, is done. Because mm. um, I think it will only benefit the amateurs here, man. It's it's a really good thing. Uh, 
Uh, ju- just lastly, Joseph, just with regards to the, the e-book before we, we wrap up here, just tell us where people can go to get that and, and order the book. Just Yeah. First of all, I'll tell you what's in it. It's not just here's a hand wrap and bish bang bosh and put it on. It's the historical connection to the hand wrap. It's the basically the the differences if you are a quorum bandage and type the differences between quality stuff and stuff that is poorer quality or better suited to, to hand wrap and then. then it's the fundamentals of hand wrapping in terms of the key areas you need to do. In terms of strength and, the, and stability, there's nothing like it. Now this method is called three phase stacking. Then it's it's hand wrapping in a multitude of combat sports, uh, athletic boxing because they haven't facilitated professional uh, hand wraps, but yet they're allowed to wear them in athletic boxing gloves. So you have to shorten the wrap somewhat, and only if you <coughs> had the knowledge of doing it, you'd know that. So it's sharing that with coaches. until they do facilitate gloves that do allow uh, professional wraps. Professional boxing wraps change from state to state in the America and then from country to country. So it's a comparison of like the NAC, the Nevada Athletic Commission. I pick one now, 467432 versus the British Board of Boxing Control, the real 3.22. And I compare those two hand wraps in terms of weight, glove fit, proprioception, mobility, strength, all those kind of things. And then I break it down into the easiest framework possible. And you'd use the same framework regardless if it was for professional, if it was for uh, professional boxing, if it was for MMA, you just shorten it. It's the same framework. And the less bandage you use, the better. If nobody ever buys it, the less bandage, because I'm a physio by trade, putting tape directly on the skin is the best thing you can do because basically what it does is proprioception. Now, for MMA, it's not a great idea because it, it stops the small joints from moving too well. But in, in terms of hand stability and, and, and providing strength on punch and contact and trauma, it's a gem. And the Nevada State Athletic Commission allow it, whereas other countries don't. And then if you flip on into other, I cover bare knuckle mood, so I, then I go into um, legal hand wraps. And because I walk, I've been blessed to walk on six continents, I've picked hand wraps up. I've picked dodgy ones up from different countries and I've made a collage, a collection of, of illegal ones and how to spot some of the illegal ones. And then the end of it is like commissioning and then hand injuries, the most common hand injuries in MMA, jersey finger, mallet finger, um, Tongue sprain, UCL sprain, stuff like that and all the rest of it. So I have Kevin Finn doing that as a master's degree in physio. We're also going to look at the mechanism of injury. So how that injury happens in the first place. So the book is all of that. It's on Amazon Kindle and it's for sale for 4 22 So I um, wanted to make it affordable. So it's loaded with video links. It's loaded with pictures. So if you're reading it and you're not great, uh, you're not great at reading. You can hit the video links and it'll fill in some of the gaps for you. So it was like rather than putting up an online course, mm-hmm. it is an online course. But the thing is, it's it's affordable for people rather than charging people two hundred pounds for a course. It's four twenty two, four dollars twenty two. And so you can just flip through it and just hit the links and it will show you all sorts of wraps and all sorts of dodgy ones and, and all sorts of um, ways to rehab and stuff like that. So it's on Amazon Kindle. Just print professional hand wraps, it should come up. Perfect, that's brilliant. Well, listen, Neil, thanks very much for coming on, Joseph. And quite to say, you've given me a newfound appreciation for Cut Men just when you're explaining some of the things, the intricacies involved. It's, it's sort of opened my eyes a wee bit. Uh, so I definitely appreciate you coming on and, and, and chatting to us about that. Uh, so thanks very much. And just for everybody else, as always, uh, we appreciate you tuning in to the show. As always, get on that YouTube channel and hit that subscribe button. And um, thanks very much, guys.